So what can you expect from today? Well, it's a very, very busy session. Um, I'm super excited to be here, but first of all, what I'm gonna do is introduce you to the panel and then we'll get straight into it. So we'll start with some CQC groundwork where I'm gonna cover the changes to the CQC strategy that were announced last week. And then I will hand over to Karen, who will be talking you through the need to know guidance and legislation. And then finally, I'll be handing over to Ravi, who's gonna to talk to you about surfacing evidence for the CQC. Great, so who are these people? Well, first of all, there is me, I am Emily, and I head up content marketing for Birdie. And if you've been to a webinar by Birdie before, you've probably seen my face. Ravi, can I hand over to you to introduce yourself next, please? Yeah, of course. So, hi everyone. My name is Ravi. I'm a senior customer success manager here at Birdie. So, my role is basically I work in partnership with all of our agencies. I think I manage just under 200 now, um, just to understand kind of what we can do together as an agency as a, as a software to really improve our success metrics, but also to really help our, our older adults. Amazing. Thank you, Ravi. And finally, I'm going to hand over to our guest of honour, who is so so excited um, for her to be here. Karen, please, could you introduce yourself? <laughs> Hello everybody, uh, I was a CQC inspector for 15 years in adult social care, uh, where I was also uh, a part of the team that developed the key lines of inquiry and the rating characteristics. Uh, but uh, more recently, I've also teamed up with uh, Care Improvement Associates as a lead consultant and mentor. Amazing, thank you so, so much for joining us. Uh, as you can hear everyone, we have some really good experts on the panel today. So please do ask as many questions as you've got and we'll try and get to them at the end. Okay, wonderful. So let's kick this off. We should have most people here by now. And what I'm gonna start with is just a little bit of coverage on the CQC's new strategy, as this will be really, really important for your upcoming inspections. Now, the next few slides are gonna be a whistle stop tour as we do have a lot to get through. But if you want any more information on anything that we covered today, whether it's from me, whether it's from Karen or from Ravi, let us know in the chat box or afterwards in the survey uh, and we'll do our best to get that information to you. So, starting with the CQC's new strategy. Now, back at the start of the pandemic, I'm sure you're all aware, the CQC stopped their routine inspections and they just really focused on the, on the services that they deem to be the higher risk and they use their transitional regulatory approach to monitor home care providers. But now, more than a year later, our records are showing there's been a 30% increase in inspections in the same period. So inspections are almost back to normal, and if you haven't had one yet, they're gonna be coming. And the CQC have also launched their new strategy, and as part of that, they'll be very slightly changing the way that they regulate, and that's what I wanted to go through just now today. So if you haven't heard about the CQC's new strategy, I'm just gonna run through the main changes and highlights before I hand over to Karen um, and she'll talk to you about the actual inspection and, and what you can expect and how you can kind of get prepared for that. But first of all, the CQC states in its new strategy document, which I will share a link after the session uh, to it if you haven't seen it. But what they say is, like the services we regulate, we're evolving to adapt to changing models of care, such as integrated systems and digitally enabled care. We'll work with providers and partners to understand how care is changing, ensuring that our regulatory model keeps pace with the changes. But what does that really mean? Well, the CQC announced that over the next year, they'll be developing how they monitor risk and they'll be testing a new framework for assessments. And this will be rolled out over the next 12 months, but the entire strategy will be implemented over the next five years. And while what they do will remain largely the same, the way that they do it will be changing a bit. And they'll be focusing in on some really, really specific areas, which you can see here on the slides. They're people and communities, smarter regulation, safety through learning and accelerating improvement. Now, I won't go into massive detail about each area just now, but I will highlight a few of the key points just over the next couple of slides. So you can really get a feel for what that means for you and for your upcoming inspection. So the first point is around people and communities and the they have said that their regulatory approach will focus on feedback and they'll be looking to regulate through the eyes of those who use services. Now, this means that they'll be placing a much heavier emphasis on what they call lived experience from both internal parties. So, you know, the people that you work with and also external parties like the people that you care for. They'll be looking at refining what good and outstanding care looks like based on this feedback and based on this lived experience. And they'll be making it much easier for you to provide feedback directly to the CQC. They'll also be focusing in on assessing local systems and how they work together. 
And what that really means is how you connect the dots to the whole care pathway, and then the experience that that then offers. Now, next up is smarter regulation. And we all knew that this one was coming. We've seen a huge uptake in digital since the pandemic and the CQC is no different. They really recognize the struggles of the manual processes that you have to go through and the problems this can cause, like duplicating information. And while they'll still be reliant on your provider information returns forms, they are looking at ways to make this easier, including a new provider portal that makes it quicker to update your information. Now their bold ambition is to be able to access the internal systems of every provider. So filling out forms like the PIR is redundant, but we're not quite there yet. But what they do want to do is make sure that the information they provide is up to date and easily accessible. With more accurate information, they'll be looking to make ratings more dynamic and meaningful so that people in the public can be sure that a rating that they see reflects the care that they'll receive. But don't worry, this doesn't mean more frequent inspections. They successfully rolled out their transitional regulatory approach during the pandemic, and that's all them test virtual inspections and rely more on the data that you shared rather than in-site, um, in-person on-site visits, sorry. Uh, and while the site inspections will still remain, they'll be using more than just those to assess you. They say that inspections will remain a key element of the regulatory toolbox, but moving forward, they'll not be the only way to regulate. But of course, the only way that the CQC can provide an up-to-date picture of quality and can assess and regulate using uh, data and other means than just uh, site visits is by making sure that the data is there in the first place. And this means that the CQC are going to be needing providers to use digital systems in order for this to be a success. So if you're not, or you don't have systems that support the data they need, you could find yourself penalised. But of course, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is a five-year strategy. Nothing is changing tomorrow. These are just things that you need to be aware of. So the third element is safety through learning. And the CQC says that improvement must be the primary response to safety concerns. So they'll be looking for an open, transparent culture that promotes candor, is candor and is curious about continuous improvement. And they highlighted again how they'll be using data to support and test and evidence the changes that you made. And they said if things aren't improved quick enough, they'll use their powers to intervene. So a heavy, heavy focus here is on how you evidence the learnings that you've made. They'll also be focusing in on how you take into account people's rights and cultures and perspectives on what matters to build a safe culture. They recently released guidance on culturally appropriate care. And if you haven't seen it, I'll share it with you after the session. But the focus here is on understanding and communicating well with people of different cultures to deliver person-centered care. And this means asking the right question to support better care and evidencing how you learn and support people's cultures and beliefs and needs and wants and goals over time. Finally, the CQC is really wanting to support providers to improve through collaboration. So this means they'll be encouraging innovation um, through technology enabled services and taking a more supportive role in their regulation, which is great news. Now, the last bit from me is just the final points from their new strategy, where they say that running through each theme are two core ambitions, and they are assessing local systems. So that's the joining up of the care pathway that I mentioned, and then people's feedback and their lived experience through this, and then tackling inequalities in health and care. And you know that relates to all sorts of things, but also uh, the culturally appropriate care that I mentioned before. Now, these are the main focuses for the CQC over the next five years. And as I said, they're the areas that you should be striving to support. Nothing is changing tomorrow, but it's really good to be aware of everything that they're planning and how it affects you. And that is it for my whistle stop summary of the CQC's new strategy. And um, what I'm going to do now is hand over to Karen, who's going to talk you through CQC inspections in detail. So, Karen, over to you. Thanks, Emily. Uh, well, today I'm going to take you through how to prepare for an inspection. Um, we'll start off with the different types of inspection that can take place. And then I'll give you some information about ratings and the frequency of inspection. I'm going to outline the key lines of inquiry or CLOEs and why it's important to, to get familiar with these. I'll talk a bit about the fundamental standards, key legislation, regulations and some key breaches of regulation. And I'll introduce you to the rating characteristics and why these are a fantastic resource for preparing your evidence ready for inspection. Then I'll give you two case examples of how to use the CLOEs and the rating characteristics to help you prepare your evidence ready for inspection. 
I'll finish off with a brief look at CQC's overall areas of focus and what to keep in mind to move you towards a good or an outstanding rating. So let's dive in. So about inspections, different types of inspection, comprehensive inspections. These look at all the, all the key questions of safe, effective, caring, responsive, and well-led. Each key area is rated and the service is rated overall. The ratings are outstanding, good, requires improvement and inadequate. If you're a domiciliary care agency, CQC usually gives 48 hours notice, though the inspection can be unannounced, particularly if there are concerns. So these inspections are carried out in relation to information received by CQC. It might be information about specific worker services doing. They're usually unannounced or announced at short notice and they focus on one or more key questions, but always well-led. This is focused inspections. They can expand to a comprehensive inspection if there are concerns during the inspection, and these can result in a change of rating. The targeted inspections, uh, this is usually to follow up on a specific area of concern, for example, if medicines are not being handled safely. The inspector looks at only this area and the overall rating will not change. It's usually unannounced, but it could be announced at short notice. So how long do the inspections last? Well, this, this depends on the size of the service, the kind of care it provides, whether there are any concerns or any outstanding practice to capture. Often the inspection lasts for one day at the premises, which is called a site visit. The inspector or part of the inspection team may also contact clients of the service or speak with staff on another day following the inspection. CQC strategy may mean that this model will change with less time or, or perhaps no time at all on site, uh, where you will need to provide your evidence remotely. So frequency of inspections, this depends on your rating. So outstanding or good rated services, the next inspection is usually within 30 months of the date that the last report was published, not the visit, but the last date of the um, publication of the report. Requires improvement, usually that's within 12 months of the, of the last publication date. Inadequate, usually within six months. And newly registered services are usually between six and 12 months. So how are registered services rated? CQC uses rules to guide them, but these are not hard and fast, and they can be changed depending on circumstances. CQC rates each key question individually. Generally, if a service is rated as requires improvement in two areas, the overall rating will be requires improvement, or inadequate in two areas, and then the overall rating will be inadequate. This means you usually need at least four out of five areas rated good, to be rated good overall. Likewise, you need at least two areas to be rated outstanding and all others to be rated good to be rated as outstanding overall. So with this in mind, how to prepare for an inspection? Well, it helps to get familiar with the five key questions that CQC cover in inspections. And the five key questions, just to recap, are safe, effective, caring, responsive, and well-led. So under SAFE, the inspector looks at areas such as safeguarding people from abuse, managing risk, safe recruitment and staffing levels, safe medicine management, infection control practice, and learning lessons when things go wrong. Under effective, the inspector looks at areas such as assessment of care needs, care planning, staff training, staff support through supervision and appraisal, meeting healthcare needs, food and drink, and consent to care. Under caring, the inspector looks at areas such as human rights, which covers the FRIDA principles, which are fairness, respect, equality, diversity, and autonomy. And they look at, at how privacy and dignity is promoted and values such as kindness, compassion, and empathy. Under responsive, the inspector looks at responding to changes in care needs, reviews, 
understanding people's individual life histories, personalities, interests and values. They look at how you provide people with accessible information so they can make informed choices. How you support people to live as interesting and stimulating a life as possible. How you deal with complaints and how you support people as they reach the end of their lives. Under well-led, the inspector looks at areas such as the quality of leadership, the culture and values of the service, governance, such as audits and surveys, how people are supported to give feedback and how the service improves people's quality of care from listening to feedback and learning from it. This is where inspectors look at partnership working with other professionals and agencies and how services are involved in the local community. So under each of the five key questions, CQC have provided prompts called the key lines of inquiry or Chloe's. So the Chloe's are a set of prompts the inspector uses to guide their inspections and to help them to judge the quality of care provided. You can find the Chloe's on CQC's website under guidance for providers, where you can navigate to adult social care. So the Chloe's are a fantastic place to start when you're preparing for an inspection, because they're also where the inspector starts too. We'll come back to them because they are important, but first underpinning the Chloe's is the legislation. Regulation of adult social care takes place under key legis legislation. So here's the key legislation. Back in 2014, New regulations came out of recommendations by Sir Robert Francis following his inquiry into care at Mid Staffordshire NHS Foundation Trust. These are the Health and Social Care Act 2008 Regulated Activities Regulations 2014 Part 3. The first section of Part 3 covers the requirement relating to persons carrying on or managing a regulated service. This includes requirements in relation to registered managers, partnerships and a new regulation which makes directors more accountable. The second section of part three are regulations which introduce the fundamental standards. These are standards below which care quality should never drop. Let's take a look at the fundamental standards now. So person-centred care. This is about tailoring care to meet individual needs and preferences. Dignity and respect. This is about respect, privacy, treating people with equality, supporting independence and supporting involvement in the local community. Consent. This sets down that people must give consent before any care or treatment is given. Safety. This is about providing safe care and preventing avoidable risk of harm. Safeguarding from abuse. Food and drink is about making sure people have enough to eat and drink to stay in good health. Premises and equipment. This is about maintaining and using equipment safely. And when there are registered premises, keeping these clean and looked after properly. Complaints. This is about supporting people to complain and having a complaint procedure where actions are taken if there are problems. Good governance. This is about having effective governance systems in place to check the quality and safety of care, which leads to improvements. Staffing, this is about having enough suit suitably qualified, competent and experienced staff. Staff must be given the support, training and supervision they need to do their job. Fit and proper staff. This is about having strong recruitment procedures so that only people who are appropriate to work with those you support are employed. Duty of candour. This is about being open and transparent with people. If something goes wrong, you must tell people what's happened, provide support and apologise. Display of ratings. This is about the requirement to display the CQC rating in a place where people can see it. This must also be on your website if you have one and the latest report from CQC must be available. So these fundamental standards and the regulations they relate to underpin the Chloe's. For example, 
Safety and safeguarding from abuse are covered under the safe Chloe's. The need for consent is covered under the effective Chloe's and good governance is covered under the well-led Chloe's. So key breaches of regulation. Inspectors will focus on the fundamental standards on the Chloe's until there is a concern and then they will start to look at the regulations. Breaches are always of a regulation. They are the law. The fundamental standards and Chloe's cannot be legally breached. For example, if a care company persistently misses calls, which leads to a person having a health crisis, the inspector will report about this under the safe key question and will record a breach of the regulation this relates to. In this case, regulation 12, safe care and treatment. There are too many regulations for me to look through all of them today, but let's look at four of the most regularly breached regulations. Regulation 11, need for consent. This is a complex area, as it also includes consideration of mental capacity. But for simplicity, this regulation requires care providers to gain people's consent to deliver care. It can be breached if the inspector can't find enough evidence of consent. Regulation 11 is one of the regulations which can result in direct prosecution when breached, which means CQC can act faster to ensure compliance. There are a number of regulations which lead to direct prosecution and you can find these on CQC's website. Regulation 12, safe care and treatment. An example breach may be that the registered manager has not assessed a moving and handling risk adequately so that a person has fallen from a hoist and been injured. Regulation 17, good governance. An example breach would be when the registered manager does not have an adequate quality assurance system in place. And for example, they may not be carrying out audits or only auditing one area, for example, MAR charts. Regulation 18, staffing. An example breach would be if staff training was very out of date so that the registered manager could not assure themselves or the inspector that staff have the skills to offer safe, good quality care. So there are other regulations you need to be aware of as a care provider. The Care Quality Commission Registration Regulations 2009 Part 4. These regulations cover such requirements as providing a statement of purpose and what you need to notify CQC about, for example, the death of a service user or a safeguarding incident. There are also other pieces of legislation which affect the way CQC require you to plan and deliver care. Some key ones are the Data Protection Act 2018. This includes safe storage of individual data and when it should be destroyed. The Equality Act 2010 and the Protected Characteristics, which I'll mention later. The Human Rights Act. This is about the Frida Principles, which stand for fairness, respect, equality, diversity and autonomy, as I mentioned earlier. The Mental Capacity Act 2005 and the Deprivation of Liberty Safeguards. This underpins everything you do about consent, capacity, best interests and any deprivation of people's liberty. There's a comprehensive list of related legislation on CQC website. So pre preparing for the inspection process. So let's imagine you've, you've read the Chloe's, you've read upon the fundamental standards and you're ready to prepare in detail for your inspection. So how do you start? Well, it pays to imagine you are an inspector for a moment and think about what they will be looking for. Have I prepared a provider information return or PIR? If you've been asked to submit this, you'll have completed one, but if not, it's worthwhile being proactive and preparing your own to be ready. The PIR is your opportunity to give CQC examples of your best practice under the five key questions. Have I sent CQC all the notifications I need to? Is my statement of purpose up to date? The statement of purpose includes information about your business, your aims and objectives, the places where you provide a service, which are your offices or locations, and information about your registered manager. Do I have an up-to-date service user guide? This is information you give to your clients, including your complaint procedure. 
So next, you need to consider the Chloe's. Remember, these are arranged under safe, effective, caring, responsive, and well-led. There are lots of Chloe's, so let's use a couple of examples to give you an idea of what's a really helpful approach. This is what I do with the care services that I support when we're preparing together for their inspection. It helps you to capture your best evidence and gives you the best chance of gaining a good or an outstanding rating. We'll drill down and consider how you might prepare for your inspection in SAFE using the CHLOE in relation to assessing and managing risk. The CHLOE headline I'm looking at goes like this. How are risks to people assessed and their safety monitored and managed so they are supported to stay safe and their freedom respected? So this is about the balance between safety and freedom. So how would you provide evidence of what you do about risks? You could begin by addressing the CHLOE above straight away. But you would be helped if you first look at a handy guide that CQC have produced to help you understand what they're looking for. And this guide is found at the end of the Chloe's and is called the Ratings Characteristics. So the Rating Characteristics are what inspectors use when they've done their inspection and are at home writing their reports and coming to a judgment about how to rate each key question. It's a really good idea to get familiar with them. They describe what an inadequate requires improvement, good and outstanding service actually look like across each of the key lines of inquiry. You can use them to benchmark your performance and to guide you on what evidence CQC will want to see. Um, I'm going to use a, an example of Tom who enjoys being outdoors. Uh, he loves speed and getting enjoyment from being in nature. Back to Tom who wanted to go cycling. Um, so his care worker has um, contacted the company in advance, explained the situation. Um, the company have got the supported cycles where Tom can sit in front of an experienced member of staff which controls the bike. Uh, and if Tom chooses his option, he gets to enjoy the speed of cycling but keeps safe from the danger of other bikes on the track or going too fast. So as Sue takes a leaflet to explain about the bikes to Tom, the cycling company provided this in easy read format, which is what Tom needs. He can understand from photos and short written sentences what going on the bikes might be like. Tom also goes to watch other people using the bikes and he de decides to go ahead. This means Sue's provided Tom with the information he needs to make his own decision about the risk. There is a risk of epileptic seizure during the activity, but this is no higher than when Tom's doing any of his day-to-day -day activities. Sue makes sure she follows his epilepsy care plan and risk assessment and takes Tom's medication with them. This means that Sue has taken a positive approach while addressing the risks involved. Tom talks with the learning disability nurse about his planned cycling activity and they reassure him that this is a great idea. Tom has a long term working relationship with the nurse and so their reassurance helps calm his nerves about the new activity. Tom and Sue attend the cycling on a lovely sunny day. Sue takes photographs with Tom's consent and Tom absolutely enjoys this and says he, he loved going fast down the track. The photos show he has a, high, a big smile on his face. Sue writes a case study about the whole process, and this is what's so important about this exercise in terms of preparing for your inspection. You need to capture your evidence so CQC can see what you've done. Sue includes how she anticipated the risk, how she provided Tom with information, how she addressed the risk, and how she provided the least restrictive option by supporting Tom to have the freedom to go fast on the bike, while a trained professional made sure he was, this was safely done. She involved his learning disability nurse to help reassure him. The approach to this risk was positive and embraced the fact that there was an acceptable element of risk. She involved Tom in gathering all the information together, including the easy read leaflet and photographs of his pre-visit and of him on the bike. This was shown to CQC during an inspection and contributed to the service gaining an outstanding rating in the safe key question. So this just goes to show that it's the areas where you're providing evidence of person-centred care and improving people's quality of life where there's a great opportunity to go for that outstanding rating. It means it's possible to aim for outstanding in every key question, including SAFE. So let's recap. When you prepare for an inspection, is your evidence in line with the key lines of inquiry? Is your evidence also in line with the ratings characteristics? So let's look at another, uh, another key question, responsive. Again, let's drill down to one particular area of the Chloe's under responsive. 
How does the service identify and meet the information and communication needs of people with a learning or sensory, uh, with a disability or sensory loss? What do the rating characteristics have to say about information and communication needs under responsive? Well, these focus on considering people's protected characteristics under the Equality Act 2010 and meeting the requirements of the Accessible Information Standard. All publicly funded adult social care services are legally required to follow the Accessible Information Standard. They must identify and meet people's needs for accessible information. Let's use another case example to explore this in a little bit more detail. So Robert's care worker, Mike, is supporting Robert three times a week. Recently, he's been planning a holiday. He assesses Robert's needs for accessible information with Robert, and he's found that he needs an easy read leaflet he can refer back to. He couldn't find anything online, so he adapted an accommodation brochure with pictorial supports and large print, which was what Robert needed due to his disability. This means Mike has considered the protected characteristics of disability, and he met the requirements of the accessible information standard. Mike recorded the work he did with Robert and kept a copy of the accessible leaflet as part of his evidence. So this contributed to the service getting an outstanding rating in the responsive key question. CQC provides further guidance on how to meet the accessible information standard on their website. So using case examples provides CQC with a story and everyone loves a story, don't they? CQC are no different. They use brief case studies in their reports all the time. And the CQC outstanding panels ask inspectors for stories like this when they're deciding on whether they'll pass a report for publication with an outstanding rating. So I'm going to finish with a look at the main areas that underpin a good and outstanding rating so that you can prepare for your inspection with confidence, knowing that you will be focusing your efforts in the right place. So equality, diversity and human rights. CQC look for evidence that you are considering, considering an equality and human rights approach to care across all the key questions. They've embedded this into their new strategy and ways to start thinking about this are, are you supporting people who may not usually be heard to have a voice? You can do this by making sure you support them to be involved in decisions about their care, that you empower them and challenge, how you challenge discrimination. We could go back to our example of Tom to provide evidence that you've not let disability or age get in the way of providing him with a really exciting and different experience, which has improved the quality of his life. You may also think of how you support someone with something as simple as going for a walk. One company I worked with recently helped Mary choose high visibility strips for her wheelchair so she could feel safe going by the road on the way to the canal to feed the swans. This meant the company had evidence that they'd challenged discrimination in the wider world. The footpath was too narrow for the wheelchair, but they overcame this obstacle. They included an account by the person of how they enjoyed the walks, photos with their consent, and large print maps of the canal walk, so Mary was able to read this and choose where she wanted to go. This provided evidence for CQC when they came to inspect and helped towards their outstanding rating in responsive. Person-centred care, over and over again, it's your evidence of person-centred care that pushes a rating towards good and outstanding. Really focus on making people's experience shine out. Record what people say in their own words, include photos, record people's involvement in care plans and risk assessments, not just a signature, but what they actually say or what they communicate to you in their preferred style. Were they happy? Then capture it. Yeah. Working in partnerships, your evidence of working in partnerships with other professionals and experts in their field will provide you with evidence across all five of the key questions. Record how you work with professionals, include their guidance specifically in care plans, risk assessments and reviews. Choose one or two key case studies to demonstrate the work with professionals that you're most proud of. Community involvement is part of the dignity and respect fundamental standard. CQC place importance of how well, you, on how well you integrate into the community and provide opportunities for people. Showcase any work you're doing to raise the profile of your service in the local community. Make links with local organisations, support charities, get involved in local initiatives, start some. This helps the people you support feel part of something bigger, that they're less isolated and that they're also making a contribution. We all feel better if we can help, don't we? And just because someone needs support doesn't mean they don't have something to give back. 
Record what you do, provide evidence that it's happening and CQC will love this. Embrace innovation and continual improvement. CQC are keen on how you use technology and innovative practice to improve people's quality of care. Again, they have included innovation and improvement in their main strategy themes. Examples can be simple. How about the use of prompt cups, which remind people with memory impairment to drink more, so reducing the risk of dehydration. Gather together examples for CQC and focus on how you have improved people's quality of life. Support good transitions of care. CQC will look for evidence of how you support good transitions of care, for example, to and from hospital. You may provide support with hospital visits or get involved in ward meetings. You may be proactive about explaining what you can offer, which avoids people going into residential care when they can be supported successfully at home. Provide evidence of when you've done this. And lastly, smarter regulation. Help CQC when it comes to the smarter regulation theme of their new strategy. They may decide to make shorter visits to your office or they might not visit at all. Do you have the evidence you need in a format that's easy to share digitally? In the future, you'll have more resp responsibility for providing evidence. It's a good idea to start thinking how you will do this now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karen. Um, I'm so glad we managed to get there with the case studies because they're so, so important. And, you know, that was where Ravi was, was going to pick up. Now, obviously, we, we sort of jumped in, Ravi. Do you want to just give a really, like, two sentences overview of the things that you said before we launch into sort of uh, capturing that evidence um, and how you can do that? Yeah, thank you so much, um, Elle. So, yeah, what um, I'm going to go through how Birdie can help. There's a few overlaps as well with, with what Karen's going to go through, which is great. Don't tell her I'm stealing her case study. Um, so uh, we can start into that. So I think for everything that kind of we're talking about with the Chloe's and how we need to hit those uh, key lines of inquiry, how we can surface that. We know that these are actions that you take all the time, right? And I'm sure with all of you watching this with us, I'm sure you can probably agree that, yes, you are looking at these Chloe's and you are trying your best to do everything. We know you do this every day, day in, day out, and it's what makes you amazing, right? So that's what makes us proud to partner with you. And our role at Birdie is to capture all the wonderful work you do, right? We're not the carers, we're not the care agency, that's you. Our job is just to capture everything that you do and make it easier for you to surface it and present it to the CQC, especially after these new guidelines. So remember, our entire company, everything we do, everyone who's hired at Birdie is focused on you, our care agencies, and improving the lives of our older adults at the end of the day. So everything we develop and we release has been thoroughly, thoroughly researched to be aligned with the CQC and our national guidelines as well. Okay. So one, the most important thing that I always tell all my agencies as well, my 200 agencies or any of you know that Birdie, along with any other software company that you use, we're just a tool, right? Just because I buy myself a snazzy new microphone doesn't automatically make me Beyonce. As much as I try and convince myself, I'm not Beyonce. So think about Birdie in the same way, okay? We all have, uh, we, you know, we have all the sections and categories on the Birdie system to really help you create, to build, and to evidence all the stories and case studies that Karen spoke about and will speak about. So you can present them easily to the CQC or any other third party, be it local authorities as well, for example. We're your library. Think of us as your library. We're keeping record of any changes and audits of, act of every action that you do. But we can only record what you put in, right? So the most important thing is, I will show you the best practice in a moment of what we would consider to be the best use case for Birdie and you know, utilizing that in the best way. But the more you put into the system, the more you can service and audit. So I think we need to kind of really keep that in mind um, to kind of put as much as you can onto the Birdie system. Um, just kind of quickly show you what your current situation is with, um, with kind of the CQC and, and as an agency, right? So it's a busy Tuesday. The CQC call, they're saying they're coming to inspect you in two days, just like what Karen said in the beginning. What do you do? It's panic, right? There's a lot of running around, like headless chickens, finding the correct paperwork, the care plans, the MAR charts. And I've, I've heard this from my agencies running to and from clients' houses to ensure everything's up to date and audited and abusing your poor printer like there's no tomorrow. So we're basically trying to centralize all of that. When it comes to kind of surfacing that evidence and showing everything, I, whenever it comes to kind of inspections, I tend to think of using Birdie kind of in two parts. So first is that library of where you've got your actions and evidence. So these are the things you do every single day. Every time you, um, you log kind of a care call, you audit a, a visit note, every time you put a MAR chart in, your client observations, assessments, and whatever you've done, they're your actions that you do to take care of the person every day. And you often don't even think about it, right? Because um, 
you know, that's your intuition. But in order to pass your CPSC inspection with flying colours and get a high rating, you'll need to evidence this, right? We know you do a fantastic job, but it's often not logged somewhere. So we want you to be able to evidence that and log it in a really quick and efficient way. So that's where you'll get to showcase your case studies and stories about great care. Um, so the second part is um, data and auditing, right? So now that you've evidenced all your, all your actions, you've got everything there, all the writings there, you need now holistic data to break everything up, find the trends and quickly audit any outliers. So we'll talk about the second part in a bit, but for now, uh, we can look at how Birdie will really help you kind of capture that evidence um, and show you kind of a great CPC case study. One thing that I always say is that care can kind of never be completely systematic, right? Exactly what, what Karen mentioned earlier when it comes to like, for example, Tom or Robert, who's kind of wanting to go on holiday and you have to decide everything. So it's really organic. Care is always organic. That needs to be flexible with our clients' needs. Um, so just carrying out your daily activities requires a wealth of knowledge. And that's something that I don't have, right? The planning changes and quick thinking, they all come from your intuition. They come from your knowledge and your experience in care. So with Birdie, you're still doing this and automatically keeping a log of everything that you do. So from building a care plan, setting their, their tasks, changing medications, completing risk assessments, keeping all their files and folders in one place on Birdie, it's all kind of done on one platform. So in this way, Birdie almost kind of acts like a net that catches all of your stories and evidence you need to show to the CQC. Okay, great. So. I want to, and I was going to do this before, so I want to go back to Karen's great case study of Tom. Let's take a look at Tom's journey right now and, and, and his care cycle. So how would it work on Birdie? What's that journey like? So the first thing would happen is you'd go into Tom's house and you'd fill out all of his details, including his desires to ride a bike, his outcomes, his medical history, and any other cultural behavioral traits that may affect his care journey with you. Like Karen mentioned, the Equality Act, right? Mentioning what parts do we need to be made aware of and how can we make sure that we actually address those needs in, in the right way. So as carers start going in and building a stronger relationship, they can give you more information as well as things go on and all the little nuances of, of, kind of Tom's care and desires. So in filling this section out, you can already evidence about 17 CQC lines of inquiry, right? Um, okay, next, uh, next part, please, Al. So you then add the medication, right? You review the medication that Tom's on for his epilepsy and you make a note of how these, how these will affect his goals, right? And if, if it can be taken outside, if it can be given at a different time, for example. So next you complete all his risk assessments, the really important part from his environment at home when he's just, you know, doing his normal care call or at the cycle center, right? So his way of communicating, what way does he like to communicate? What's his independence like? You can write all of that on, on our kind of care plan section. And all of this will be visible to the carers before they even begin their visits with Tom. So they're always briefed beforehand. Then you go and you get Tom to sign everything on Birdie electronically. Like Karen said, consent is really key for this. So all the documents that you've got, you can get Tom to sign everything. Even if, you've got, even if he's got dexterity issues, he can still kind of fill everything out there and you can sign it really easily. Then you upload all of his accessible information guides, any other documents that you may have for Tom to allow the carers to understand a bit more into what they need to do and to evidence that you've showed them all the guides and what, you know, what the procedures are and that he understands the risk and to show the carers as well that they're also informed before they start the call. You then add the task to the visits. So you've got all the little tasks that you, you want to you know, make Tom's care as person-centered as possible with notes to really emphasize exactly what the carers need to do. And you can also add a, a task for that day, for example, to take him to the cycle center. So exactly, and write exactly all the preparations that the carers need to do beforehand and what Tom's preferences are when he goes outside and what he likes to do. So as carers go into the calls on the big cycle day, they could write notes about how Tom is feeling about the cycle day, what will keep him engaged and happy. And when carers go in beforehand, they can log any concerns that Tom may have as well. Maybe he's feeling a bit anxious or he's a bit nervous about going outside into the cycle center and you know, cycling by himself. All of this will be visible for the carer to read before they take Tom out. So they're prepared in the best way. Then you can also keep the family in loop so that we have a family app as they'll see all the instant updates via the app. If there are any concerns as well that family has maybe seen, they can raise it with you in the office so you can update his care plan. And now it's a big day. So you take him to the cycle center, you take a photo, just like what Karen said, with consent, take photos, as many as you like, and upload it onto his visit plan for the office to see, for the family to see. And of course, once it's done, you can update his profile, his outcomes, you can change the risk assessment because he wants to go out more often and keep it all up to date. And as your relationship continues to grow with Tom, you continue adding those notes and tasks and you update the about me. So you update everything so you can help him best to reach his outcomes. And more, most importantly, 
remain, you know, make sure he's happy and he's content and he's kind of improving day by day. And when it comes to CQC inspection, all of these things that you've done kind of without even thinking about, you've got it all there. So you can, a whole case study that you can just show the CQC with actions taken, dates, times, audits, and everything ready to go. Okay, fantastic. So that's the product itself. Now you can gather and present this data. How? Well, by using Birdie, we hold a plethora of data and trends, which you can monitor, audit, and share. So as a software, obviously, we're not the feeding part. We're just the electronic software. So we can't see if, how emotional, you know, how well that's happening. But we can help you answer those Chloe's with the data that we hold. For example, governance, what um, Karen was talking about, showing you that you've got the right data to drive those improvements. So here you can see you can look at all of your latest care quality and operational metrics. We spent kind of a month, more than a month, looking at all the key lines of inquiry and understanding how much data we can we can kind of answer with those key lines of inquiry. So drilling it down into exactly which carer, which client, when did it happen, how do we improve on it, answering all those questions where maybe you, historically you had to look at all the paper charts and everything to understand that. Here it's there at your fingertips. And this you can quickly share with your colleagues so you can audit all of that care share it with different members of staff so they can take their own steps, their own actions, share it with carers so they can automatically audit their own care that they're delivering and also share it with the local authorities with the CQC. So they're all kind of kept in that loop because obviously the client's always in the middle of everything, right? So making sure that everyone is aware of what's going on with the client and delivering the safest and person-centered care that you can. So let's go back to that initial kind of slide that I showed you when it comes to CQC inspection. So what we're trying to do at Birdie, and with your help, we will do, we'll, you know, we'll do it again, is that you're busy working on Tuesday, and if the CQC come, we want you to be confident enough to open up the Birdie tool, the product itself, open up the analytical tool which we've got, and you can show them everything. You're ready to go. You don't even if, like Karen says, they come unannounced, you can show them everything, right? So. And that's obviously kind of uh, a drop in the ocean of what we can offer. I just wanted to show you a quick uh, kind of uh, case study so you know kind of how it would work. We've got so many different things. We've got, for example, the family app where families can see everything, assessments, notes, observations, all of these different areas where we really have looked into the NICE guidelines, the other guidelines as well that are around, including the CQC, to really make it as easy and person-centered for you as an agency. So please do book some time in with your, you know, book, book a demo with us if you're already with us please speak to your account manager we're more than happy and that's kind of our entire role utilize us we're all here to help you um so yeah i'll hand it back to l now and i think we do have some time for q a fantastic <laughs> yes sorry just had to unmute myself we have got four minutes <laughs> um we're a little bit tighter for time than i had hoped but we're we're still okay so let me just double check um in the Q&A box, we've just got a couple of questions about uh, replay link. Yes, we'll be sending that to you and we will share with you the slides, anything that we mentioned today. Uh, now, let me have a look in the chat. We have a question from Marianka. How digital can help managers? Ravi, that's probably one for you, more managers rather than carers, I assume there. Yeah, fantastic. So Birdie itself is, like we say, it's a tool for everything, to, for you to put everything in one place, right? So for you as managers, rather than you having to faff around trying to find different paperwork and different mar charts and put it all in kind of different areas and printing off, you know, heaps and heaps of paper, you've got one place now where you can store everything, you can evidence everything as well. And rather than you having to pull paperwork out when it comes to inspection time, you've got whatever the carers log on, whatever you log, it's all there on one system for you to then present to the CQC. Thanks, Ravi. There's one question as well here for Karen. How long after initial registration should we expect our first inspection? Oh, that's a lot of long words. <laughs> um, it's usually between six and 12 months. Um, I, I have known it to go on for longer than that. Uh, it depends really on uh, CQC's risk model for the area that they're working in. So if they have a lot of services that they are um, needed to go to because there are problems or safety issues or you know services that are rated inadequate or they're doing enforcement work, they will, if they, if they can assure themselves that the service is, is fairly safe or is safe, then um, they may push it just beyond the 12 months, uh, but usually they, they try and stick to within a 12 month period uh, for you to have your first inspection. Thank you, that's great. I think that, that should have perfectly answered Colin's question there. There's one more question as well. Does Birdie work with access or any rostering system? Ravi, over to you. Yes, I think my current agencies will be like, yes, 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 we work with uh, many rostering systems. 
and we work in partnership with them because we know we want to focus on our care delivery we know we want to focus on making the quality better making sure that you know you're hitting all those chloe's and when it comes to anything else we kind of partner with our with our lovely um rostering providers thank you ravi now i don't think is there any more questions coming in oh one more from nina here for Karen, how long is it taking for managers to receive their interview for registration at the moment? I'm not sure of the, the answer to that, to be quite honest. I think that it, it, it tends to vary depending on you know, how busy they are. It's a bit of a movable feast. And as I'm not actually working with CQC at the moment, I'm not, I'm not part of that, to that information. But it's always worthwhile giving them a ring and asking them you know, if they can give you any, any kind of indication just so that you can um, have a bit of an idea but uh, I'm not absolutely certain of the answer to that. I would give them a ring. No, perfect. Um, one from Eugenia here, can you ask CQC to inspect you as a new provider? So can you actually ask them to do that or is it a waiting game, Karen? Um, no, I think the, the, yeah, the simple answer is you can ask, but uh, they might not do that. Um, you, can't, you can't require CQC to come out and, um, and inspect you. They would have to, the, um, the impetus will come from them. So they would take note of it and they would, they would recognise that that was what you were wanting, um, but they would have to fit it around their other work. No, that's, that's perfect. Uh, thank you for summarising that one. There's just one final point here before we head off. Um, there's a couple of questions around Birdie software in specific, but we'll get back to you if you've asked a Birdie question um, because we're right on time. But finally, uh, Karen, can you just give us a really quick overview of how CIA can help with the mock inspections and kind of what you do in that space and how you can help agencies do everything that you talked about today? Uh, how CIA can help with the mock inspections, I mean, that's, you know, a fantastic resource, really. Um, if, um, if services are wanting to have a, a sort of a dry run or an external company to come in and have, have that sort of external eye over what you do, um, an external audit or a, or a mock inspection, for want of a better way of putting that, is a, it's very helpful, actually, because it's, it's a kind of friendly approach. It's like a critical friend, really. You know, uh, CIA um, consultants all, all have you know a lot of experience of doing this sort of work, and can give you objective feedback on um, how to meet the uh, you know the regulations and how to improve as well. So it's a really good benchmarking um, exercise. Uh, and uh, you know, if you, you're thinking that you would like to do that, I would urge you to get in touch with CIA about that. Yeah, really, really highly recommend that. And we will send some details over after the session with the recording, the slides, and how you can get in touch with CIA to get um, your mock inspection for sure. So that is all that we have time for today. Uh, we're one minute over, sorry about that, everyone. But a huge thank you to everyone who attended today. And of course, a massive, massive thank you to our expert guest, Karen, and also to Ravi for sharing expertise with us today. But that is all from all of us. Thank you so, so much for joining us. Um, and I do really hope that you will come and join us for another webinar session soon. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.